Hey everybody, it's time for discussion C4, electrochemical cells. I got some good news for you. This is the final lesson of the course. Okay, so a little bit of background. Uh, voltage, we looked at a lot of these things in unit nine. The voltage of a cell will depend on the nature of the reactive material. So we're basically talking about the electrodes that are being used and the um, electrolytes. So uh, we're looking at uh, differences in mass, surface area, and the number of electrons transferred. Those will affect the voltage. Also, the temperature of the reaction. The hotter uh, your cell is, the faster the reaction will go. Now, internal resistance limits the amount of current that can flow through the cell. And this is mainly dependent on the mobility of ions in the electrolyte. So the faster the ions are able to move, the lower the internal resistance will be. As so we're gonna look at a number of different types of cells here. Primary cells, these are one-use batteries. They use non-reversible reactions. These are basically like your Duracell batteries that you put in uh, whatever, your toys, I guess. Secondary cells are rechargeable batteries. Now they use reversible redox reactions and they can be reversed by using electricity. So we're gonna look at lead acid batteries, lithium ion batteries, and nickel cadmium batteries. The next thing we're gonna look at are fuel cells. Uh, we're gonna look at the hydrogen fuel cell, a methanol or ethanol fuel cell, concentration cells, and finally microbial cells. So let's zoom in on the secondary cells. The first is the lead acid battery. And the lead acid battery is the battery we all have in our cars. So our electrodes are made out of lead four oxide, which is PbO2 and solid lead. All right, so we're gonna use sulfuric acid as the electrolyte. Now, when we discharge the battery, if you look at our little diagram, lead to sulfate PBSO4 is going to form at both electrodes as the battery discharges. So our reactions in our battery at the anode, lead is going to react with the bisulfate ion to produce lead to sulfate, a hydrogen ion, and a pair of electrons. At the cathode, those electrons are gonna be added to the lead four oxide with some hydrogen ions and uh, bisulfate to produce lead to sulfate and water. Now, I just want to point out with these secondary cells, I've scanned all of the paper threes since the beginning of this uh, new curriculum, and I haven't seen uh, any example where they ask you to reproduce the equations in secondary cells, but you are supposed to be familiar with them. The main thing they're gonna ask you about is advantages and disadvantages. All right, so a lithium ion battery, this is like the battery we have in our laptops and phones. So that at the anode, lithium atoms are absorbed in a mesh of graphite electrodes. So those little yellow dots here are lithium atoms. All right, at our cathode, we have lithium cobalt oxide. Right, so that's what that electrode is made out of. All right, so we got to make sure we use a non-aqueous electrolyte here because we know lithium is an alkali metal and will react violently with water, so we cannot use water in our electrolyte. All right, so when the battery discharges, the lithium atoms at the anode are oxidized. That frees up electrons, which can travel through the external circuit to the cathode. Now, the lithium ions that are produced will flow through a separator, and at the cathode will be added to cobalt two oxide. So the electrons that are produced and the lithium ions are added to the COO2 to produce lithium cobalt oxide. All right, so if you wanna do the reverse uh, when we're charging, all you gotta do is reverse those reactions. Now again, I haven't seen them ask uh, you to produce these equations, but they are, I have seen them ask about the advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages of a lithium ion battery, they hold on to their charge very, very well, which is nice because if you're not gonna be using your phone, you don't want it to constantly be draining. They're very, very lightweight because uh, they use lithium, which has an atomic number of three. It's a very, very light uh, element. Um, they don't involve any heavy metals, so the disposal is relatively easily, easy. Excuse me. Disadvantages, they are sensitive to heat that's why um, sometimes if you have an iPhone out in the sun, it will say too hot, cool down before you can use it. 
Now, if they're exposed to too much heat, they can rapidly discharge or they can explode, which we saw with those Samsung Galaxy phones. All right, next is nickel cadmium batteries. So at the cathode in the nickel cadmium battery, we have a nickel oxygen hydroxide complex, and that will be reduced into nickel two hydroxide. At the anode, cadmium will be oxidized into cadmium two hydroxide. Now, because we're producing bases at both electrodes, our electrolyte here is going to be uh, an alkali, probably sodium or potassium hydroxide. So the reactions in the battery, when we're discharging at the anode, again, the cadmium is going to produce cadmium two hydroxide. So we're gonna add it to two hydroxide ions, which will free up a pair of electrons. Those two electrons um, at the cathode will add to the NiOOH with water to produce nickel two hydroxide and hydroxide ions. So it's kind of nice, the hydroxide ions are consumed at the anode and then produced again at the cathode. So we don't have to continually add base to this battery. So again, to do the charging reactions, just reverse these equations. All right, so advantages and disadvantages, they have a very low internal resistance because hydroxide is the only electrolyte. They can undergo full discharge without damage. Now, uh, the, uh, the disadvantages are the same as the lithium ion battery, so they're sensitive to heat, they can cause rapid discharge, and they can also explode. There's one additional disadvantage. They use nickel and cadmium, and cadmium is very, very toxic, so disposal of them is problematic. All right, fuel cells. Fuel cells use what is known as a proton exchange membrane. Now, excuse me, that uses an electrolyte and a separator with bipolar plates as electrodes. They also use platinum, they also use platinum catalysts, and those platinum catalysts make these fuel cells very, very expensive. Uh, we're well, also going to talk about sort of an alkali fuel cell. And the alkali fuel cell works in the same way as the PEM fuel cells, only we're going to use hydroxide ions as the primary electrolyte instead of H+. All right, so here's the hydrogen fuel cell. In the hydrogen fuel cell, hydrogen and oxygen are oxidized and reduced to produce water. So we have our hydrogen fuel, which is input into the fuel cell. Now, the covalent bond between the hydrogen atoms is broken, freeing up the electrons, which can travel through the external circuit and produce work. The protons that are produced travel through the proton exchange membrane over to the cathode. Now in the cathode, we input air, which is primarily oxygen and nitrogen. And the oxygen in the air will react with the hydrogen ions to produce water and nitrogen, uh, nothing really is going to happen to it. It's just going to be spit out because nitrogen is exceptionally stable. Right, so when we have our we have our two and a half equations here, hydrogen breaking apart into a pair of protons and freeing up two electrons, and then at the cathode, oxygen reacting with those protons and those electrons to produce water. So if we balanced and combined these two half equations, the equation, uh, the overall equation you would get is hydrogen plus oxygen making water. So it really doesn't get any more environmentally friendly than that. So our sources of hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen just comes from the air, so it's highly abundant. Water, hydrogen can be produced in two ways. One is the electrolysis of water. Now that is not advantageous because that process itself requires energy or the gasification of hydrocarbons. Now we know when you gasify a hydrocarbon, you're gonna produce synthesis gas and you can also produce hydrogen. And that hydrogen um, can be collected for use in a hydrogen fuel cell. All right, so advantages and disadvantages. Now the gr greatest advantage is virtually no produced pollution is produced. Water and nitrogen are the only byproducts. The fuels are incredibly abundant and hydrogen has an incredibly high specific energy because it's so light, it releases a lot of energy per gram. Disadvantages, the platinum catalysts are expensive and the fuel has to be separated and purified. If you have oxygen mixed in with your hydrogen, then that hydrogen and oxygen is going to react over at the anode and you won't have any electrons traveling through the external circuit. Finally, gases, are not very dense. So they're gonna take up a lot of space 
And so the fuel amounts are limited. You can't have a very big tank of hydrogen. All right, next is the direct methanol fuel cell. In the methanol fuel cell, we use one molar methanol as opposed to hydrogen as the source of hydrogen ions, but the same thing is occurring. The electrons are freed up at the anode, travel through the external circuit to produce work, and the protons that are produced go through to the, go through the PEM to the cathode. Now, the only difference here is we're going to be oxidizing alcohol. So we're going to take our alcohol, react it with water, and that is going to produce carbon dioxide. In the process, we're going to remove the protons from the methanol and the electrons. So the electrons can travel through the external circuit. Once the protons travel through the PEM, the same exact thing happens as in the hydrogen fuel cell. The oxygen in the air will react with those hydrogens to produce water. So our cathode reaction is just oxygen plus hydrogen ions making water. All right, now if you get the overall equation here, you see that it's just methanol with oxygen making carbon dioxide and water. That's the same process that occurs in the, ox or the uh, combustion of uh, methanol. But this is just a more elegant way to do it as opposed to burning it. All right, so advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you have a fairly decent energy density, much greater than the hydrogen fuel cell because the fuels are liquid. Right? It's carbon neutral. Even though carbon dioxide is produced, it is derived from, the, the, the fuel is derived from plants. And it's easier to store and transport because it's so much more dense than hydrogen. Now, the disadvantage, it requires even more platinum to operate, so they are very, very expensive. Additionally, the fuel, uh, this isn't written here, but it's another disadvantage. The fuel is much more expensive to produce as well because you have to grow and cultivate the plants, ferment them to produce the alcohol, and that's a lot more um, energetic than just uh, collecting hydrogen from a process that is going to be undergone anyways. Okay, so calculations for cells. The first calculation we're gonna do is thermodynamic efficiency. Thermodynamic efficiency is just the ratio of the work produced by the cell divided by the energy input to make the cell go. So basically it's just the Gibbs free energy value divided by the change in enthalpy value at standard conditions. So let's look at the thermodynamic efficiency of a hydrogen fuel cell. So if we look at this equation, we have hydrogen being added to oxygen to produce one mole of water. So what we actually have here is the enthalpy of formation of water. Whatever energy is reduced in this process is how much energy is produced to create water. So if we want to calculate our thermodynamic efficiency, we're going to need our change in Gibbs free energy divided by our change in enthalpy. And so we're going to have to dive into our data booklet to get these values. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at the enthalpy for of formation of liquid water. So if we look at our table here, we have water. Beware, we have water twice as water and steam. We are going to be looking for the enthalpy change of liquid water. So the delta H value for that process is negative 285.8. And the Gibbs free energy change, which is in the second column, is negative 237.1. So when we perform that calculation, we get 82.96, or 0 0.8296, which is about 83.0% efficient. All right, not too shabby. Now let's look at an example with a methanol fuel cell. So in the methanol fuel cell, the process that is occurring is methanol is being reacted with, um, oops, now let me start that over because I just made a mistake. Methanol is being reacted with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. All right, so let me go ahead and balance this equation. Boom. 
All right, so if we want to calculate the thermodynamic efficiency, we're going to need the delta G value divided by the delta H value. So again, I have to go in my data booklet. Now, if I look at this equation, I see that we are um, taking alcohol, reacting it with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. So this process represents the enthalpy of combustion for methanol. So to find the data for enthalpy of combustion, we're going to have to look in table 13. So we find methanol down here. We see it has an enthalpy of combustion of negative 726. Now, this table does not give us any value about Gibbs free energy. Now, so we're going to have to go back to table uh, 12 to calculate the total Gibbs free energy change for this process using products minus reactants, our good old PAL. Now you may be a little concerned that we're going to mix combustion data with um, formation data, but fear not because they generally coincide pretty well. We looked at this equation and called it the formation of water, but technically it's also the combustion of hydrogen. So our delta H value for that process was 285.8. If you look in um, table 13 for hydrogen, you see that the value is negative 286. So that's pretty close. Close enough, certainly, for this high school uh, course. All right, so I'm going to pause the video while I set up the reaction uh, so we don't waste a lot of time. Okay, so I got all my values for delta G. So the Gibbs free energy of formation of methanol is negative 167. In enthalpy of formation of elements is zero. And for carbon dioxide is negative 394.4. And for water is negative 228.6. So when I plug into my products minus reactants, I'm going to have negative 394.4 plus two times negative 228.6. Don't forget to follow your coefficients. And I'm going to subtract from that negative 167. So it's basically the same as adding 167. When I perform that calculation, I get negative 684.6 kilojoules per mole. So we'll plug that into our thermodynamic efficiency equation. And when I do that, I get um, 0 0.943. When we multiply that by 100, we get 94.3% efficient. So that is a fairly efficient fuel cell. Okay, next we have the Nernst equation. And the Nernst equation is used to determine the voltage of a cell at non-standard conditions. When we uh, calculated E theta uh, back in unit 9, that was the voltage of the cell at standard conditions. So 298 Kelvin, one atmosphere of pressure with one molar solutions. So in this equation, we have E, which is the non-standard voltage. We have E0, which is the standard cell potential. N is the number of electrons. F is Faraday's constant, which in the data booklet is just 96,500 coulombs per mole. Temperature is the Kelvin temperature, or T is the Kelvin temperature, excuse me. And we have, finally, we're going to multiply by the natural log of Q. So remember, Q is our reaction quotient. So it's just our equilibrium constant with not necessarily equilibrium concentrations. And again, this is in the data booklet, so you don't have to memorize it. You just have to know what each of the factors mean. So here's an example. It says, given the standard cell notation for aluminum iron uh, cell, we're going to have aluminum being oxidized into aluminum ions at a 0 0.01 molar concentration, and then iron two ions being reduced into iron at a 0.1 molar concentration. So calculate the EMF of the cell. All right, so the first step, we're going to determine E0 using section 24 of the data booklet. So let's go ahead and do that. Here's table 24. So we have aluminum being oxidized into aluminum ions. So we're going to go ahead and take that uh, standard, electro, uh, standard electro potential and reverse it. And we're going to add that to the standard electro standard reduction potential of iron 2 being reduced into iron, which is negative 
So when I perform that calculation, 1.66 minus 0.45, I'm going to get a standard cell potential of 1.21. All right, the next thing we're going to need to do is write the net equation to get a value for Q. So when we do that, we know our equation is going to be aluminum plus iron 2 going over into aluminum 3 and iron. Now we're going to have to balance this. So the first thing I'll do is balance the charge. Once I do that, I'm going to balance all the atoms. And there's our balanced equation. Right, so our Q is going to be uh, the concentration of aluminum ions squared divided by the concentration of iron 2 ions cubed. So our aluminum concentration is 0 0.01. We're going to square that and divide it by 0 0.1 cubed. So the next step is to plug in all the numbers and solve. So our equation is E equals E theta minus RT over NF times the natural log of Q. So our standard cell potential is 1.21 minus R, which is 8.31 times T, which if we're not given a temperature, we're going to go ahead and assume it's 298 Kelvin. We're going to divide by the number of electrons transferred. So if we looked at each half equation, we would see that six electrons are going to be transferred in uh, each for each uh, run of this reaction. Excuse me, that was a little rough. So I'm going to take the number six and multiply it by Faraday's constant which is 9.65 times 10 to the fourth. Finally, I'm going to multiply by the natural log of 0 0.01 squared divided by 0 0.1 cubed. I'm going to pause the video while I perform this calculation. Okay, so when I punch in those numbers, I get 1.22 volts. So changing the concentrations doesn't have much effect on the voltage, but it does have some. All right, so next we have concentration cells. In a concentration cell, the same electrodes will be used in each half cell. And the voltage is determined from the differences in concentration of the two cells. So here in an iron concentration cell, both of our electrodes will be made of iron, but at different concentrations. So if I want to calculate the EMF of the cell, I'm going to follow the exact same process. So I have my standard potentials for this uh, process. And since it's the same uh, process, our value for the standard cell potential is going to be zero. I'm going to pause here while I get another piece of paper. All right, so let me uh, pause the video really quickly while I set up this calculation just to save time. All right, so when we perform this calculation, we calculate that the voltage of this cell is negative 0 0.0295 or 0 0.030 volts. Not a very powerful cell, but that's to be expected. And finally, microbial cells. So a microbial cell uses um, chemi or converts chemical into electrical energy using a bacterial anaerobic oxidation of organic compounds. So it's important to note aerobic oxidation, oxidation that involves oxygen, will not produce electrons. So they use something called the geobacter uh, bacteria. And that will oxidize ethanoate ions um, to form carbon dioxide and electrons. Now, those electrons will be added to oxygen to produce hydrogen, or excuse me, oxygen and hydrogen to produce water. And so I haven't really seen them ask much about the microbial cell um, so far. And that means it's probably likely to show up on your test. Okay, so there's one more quick thing I want to say. Uh, for the secondary cells we looked at, lead acid, lithium ion,
and nickel cadmium. Uh, like I said, I haven't seen them ask you to produce the equations that occur in those reactions, but I have seen them ask you to produce the half equations that occur in the PEM fuel cells, methanol and hydrogen. And uh, the reason I think they do that is because those are actually pretty easy to do. As long as you understand that methanol is going to produce carbon dioxide, you could just balance that equation using the method we learned in Unit 9, the half reaction method. Right. Now, I've seen in the exams they've given so far, they actually give you the overall equation, so it's easy to determine what's being oxidized and reduced, and it just becomes a typical uh, balancing equation in acidic solution. So um, make sure you bone up on those, and you're going to be good to go. All right. All right, well, that is it for this discussion. If you have any questions, please bring them to class, as always. And I hope you enjoyed IB Chemistry HL.